Here we are again. That was <laughs> the fastest bio break in recorded history. <laughs> yeah, I'm lucky the the bathroom is not all the way across uh, the house, so <laughs> I only had like a small run to make. So yes, <laughs> we made it. Okay, so the part, the last session was your expertise. Now we are moving on to my. Uh, my neck of the woods. So I would like to introduce Purnima Nayar as our next uh, presenter. Uh, let's see if she's here. Hello. Hi. Hi. Good Hi. evening. <laughs> good evening. How are you doing? I am well, thank you. How are you? I'm I'm well as well. Esther is relieved. <laughs> so. <laughs> I do apologize for that. I didn't know that. It, it would become so hectic. I thought I had all the time in the world. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Purnima, welcome. Thank you. Um, Pleased to be I here. Was, uh, yeah, it's very nice to have you. So I won't take up much of your time because before you can start your session. I just wanted to ask, um, uh, you've been uh, speaking uh, in public for a while now. I was wondering, since you are an MVP and I I'm guessing people are watching who also want to start uh, speaking in public. How did you get started with it? Uh, good question, actually. So um, I am a part of uh, Umbraqua community as well. Umbraqua is a .NET based open source CMS with a very active community. And I was invited as a speaker to the German festival back in 2019. Um, so I presented for the first time there um, and then I decided that this is something I want to <laughs> continue doing. And then I started talking tech. Actually, my first talk was not a tech talk. Uh, and then I started doing tech talks and I decided, yeah, this is something I want to do. Being on stage is not a new thing for me because I am an artist as well. Uh, I'm someone who is training to be a singer as well. So being on the stage is not a new thing, but, uh, being on the stage singing and being on the stage talking are two different things. Okay, so now I have to ask, <laughs> what, what kind of stuff do you perform? Okay, so I am also a student at the moment learning uh, Carnatic vocals. So Carnatic music is a stream of Indian classical music and I've been a student for the past three and a half years although that I have done few years in my childhood and teens as well. So I am working towards my first stage performance, hopefully in a couple of years from now. <laughs> that will be like a proper traditional uh, kind of concert. Wow. <laughs> oh, then, then we definitely need to have you back and just create a whole new uh, <laughs> life after Azure. <laughs> <laughs> show, probably uh, or, um, because I love discovering uh, not just the technical knowledge but also the persons behind uh, um, like what you like and what you do uh, to relax so this is awesome yeah absolutely so when I'm not thinking about code I'm either with my daughter or I am working on my music in my head <laughs> That is amazing. Yeah, I, I know how good. I sound in the shower, so I will not put you <laughs> on the stand because um, I know from my personal experience, some things you need to keep private. <laughs> but yes, I just love to discover uh, uh, the personal side. Awesome. Brilliant. All right, so and I, I was already down. excited to, um, to learn a lot more about... Um, Azure Static Web Apps. So um, I guess we can definitely zoom in on the, the, the singing. But um, basically, I'm very excited to learn new, new technologies and new Azure services. So I'll just try to shut up and let you get started <laughs> with the presentation. Absolutely. Thank you. So let me share my screen to begin with. Screen three. Hello, and uh, pleased to be here. Thank you for having me at Azure Thursdays today. I'll be talking about Azure Static Web Apps. A little bit about myself before we start off. 
I am Purnima Nair. I'm a freelance.NET developer based in Berkshire, UK. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP for developer technologies, and um, I have also been an Umbraco MVP for the past three years. For those who don't know Umbraco, Umbraco is a .NET based open source CMS. Known work me, I think you just knew about me, but reiterating it, I'm a mummy to a nearly seven year old girl. I spend a lot of time reading. That's my winding down process. And of course, there is Carnatic music, which uh, I am a student of as well. Let's talk about modern web app development for a minute before we talk about Azure Static Web Apps. So these days, there's a whole um, focus on static frontends and serverless APIs. When I mean static frontends, there's HTML. And of course, there's the, there's the whole new realm of JavaScript libraries like Angular, Vue, React, all talking to APIs uh, and web apps based on those. There's also the whole new realm of static site generators. And things are getting more exciting with powerful modern browsers that support WebAssembly. And that has made .NET to run on the browser with Blazor WebAssembly. So very exciting. So now let us consider an ASP.NET MVC traditional app. What it is doing is two different things at, a, at any point of time. It's doing all the heavy lifting that an API can do. And at the same time, it is also serving static content like HTML, JavaScript, your imagery, all of that. So, um, so there should be a way to make this much better for um, sites or apps where static front ends and APIs are used. And that is the whole thought process behind Azure Static Web Apps. So Azure Static Web Apps is a complete hosting platform, as Microsoft says it, for full stack apps with static or pre-built and pre-rendered uh, front end, and with the option of having an API, a serverless API backend. It's a turnkey service, uh, and it has two parts. The first part is the app itself to serve static content, and the static content is served through globally distributed locations. And you also have the option of having a serverless API powered using Azure Functions. Both are, both are part of the same app. So it's like a package. Uh, the fun fact is because the uh, app is always served from the nearest location to the user, it is performant. And so it is doing what it is supposed to do. That is delivery of static content. So which means it's optimized for content delivery. And of course, we have the API support using Azure Functions, which means that it can scale on demand as well, which makes the platform quite performant. And the ideal candidates for static web apps or SWAs are Blazor, uh, WebAssembly-based Blazor, uh, Angular, Vue, React, JavaScript libraries, or even static site generators like ViewPress or Gatsby.js. Now, you might be thinking, why Azure Static Web Apps when we can achieve the same using, say, Azure Storage? There are some standard features which makes it uh, or which makes Azure Static Web Apps have the edge over uh, Azure Storage. The first one is GitHub and Azure DevOps integration. There's first class GitHub and Azure DevOps integration. We'll have a look at it shortly. Uh, there's globally distributed static content. Content is always globally distributed and served from the location closer to the user, which means it's always performant. Free SSL certificates and support for custom domains, and that's Apex domains as well. There's managed authentication provider integrations. Uh, we will speak about that shortly. Uh, there's customizable uh, authorization role definitions. Uh, again, we'll look into that shortly. Routing rules, uh, as well as integrated API support, all of which we will cover through in my session. Now, I'm a developer, and I would really like to know what I get when I use Azure Static Web Apps. Uh, from Microsoft perspective, Static Web Apps are a complete solution starting from local development to hosting. And there's also a, a workflow attached to this whole process, which is very, very uh, similar to a developer's daily workflow. Let's see what happens in here. In a nutshell, a developer can check in code, and that triggers a deployment. The deployment is both the API as well as the static content, because both are a part of the same app. 
Now, if you are wondering, hey, that's not very flexible. Uh, I need the flexibility to deploy the API separately as well as the static content separately. Hold your thought for a moment. I will come back to that. Now, let's have a look at this in uh, greater detail. Azure Static Web Apps is pretty opinionated about where you store your code at the moment. Um, so it can be GitHub or Azure DevOps at the moment, and there's first-class integrations to both these uh, Git repositories. Uh, the Azure Static Web App, when you create one, it's tied up to Azure uh, DevOps repo or a GitHub repo, and then it kind of watches a branch, say the main branch. When a developer checks in code to the main branch, a GitHub action is triggered or the pipelines are triggered, and that deploys your code into the Azure Static Web App, both API as well as static content. Uh, now, if there is a PR uh, uh, raised against the main branch, that is also triggered. Uh, that also triggers a deployment and deploys to a staging environment. We will see that shortly as well. But in a nutshell, you can check in code and deploy that. We also get staging environments to preview our work if you want. And out of the box, the build process understands what is needed to build and deploy most of the frameworks and libraries out there. So that is all covered for you using GitHub Actions or pipelines. Uh, so as a developer, I can worry less about the DevOps aspect of the whole process, and I can focus on what I'm good at, that is code. There are two hosting plans with Azure Static Web Apps. The first one is the free plan, which is a personal, uh, which is uh, used for personal or hobby projects, or that's what Microsoft says we should use it for. And then there's a standard plan, which is used for production apps. Uh, both free plan and standard plan uh, get, uh, get all the advantages of first class integrations with GitHub and Azure DevOps. It gets free SSL certificate, the CDN, the custom domain support, all of that is there in both free and standard. But where this differs uh, is these, three, these four points. Um, the production app has a bigger size. Uh, production app, I think it's 500 MB compared to the 250 MB for the free one. Uh, for the production app, we get more staging environments. I think we get 10, uh, whereas we get three concurrent staging environments for the uh, free one. With uh, the standard of the production app, you have the ability to bring your own Azure function. So at this point, you can tie up your own Azure function to your static web app. And at that point, managing the Azure function, deploying the Azure function is your own responsibility. You can have your own pipelines for it. The code check-in and deployment will only happen to the static content from there on. Uh, and then you always have, uh, you can also have custom authentication providers with the standard of the production app. Uh, with the free app, I think it's Azure AD, GitHub, and Twitter that is available. If you want to bring in your own authentication providers like Apple or Google or uh, Facebook or a custom or a, a custom Active Directory tenant, you you need to have the standard plan for that. And there are certain tools available to make uh, lives easier for developers as well. Uh, there's a whole host of GitHub starter templates. So if I show you where it is. It's in this repo called Static Web Dev. There's a whole host of repositories, which are like GitHub um, starter repositories or template repositories. And there are starter repositories for many of the known uh, frameworks out there, including Blazor. Uh, my demo is based on Blazor today, so I'll be using the Blazor starter. Uh, and there's also this curated list of resources, which is absolutely awesome. I have included a link to this in my resource list as well. So feel free to have a look later on. Uh, so before we do uh, go any further, let me create uh, my own repo for this. Using this template, I am going to create a repo called Azure Thursdays Demo. I'm going to keep it private for the minute. So that creates a repository for me in my account, which I can always check out. So let me get that checked out as well while we talk about the next tool, clone Git repository.
Oh, it's it's picked up the wrong repository for some reason. Clone git repository. Nima Naya slash Azure. Come on. Azure Thursdays demo. There we go. So that must be checking out. Yeah, there's also a very custom CLI tool that Microsoft has put together uh, to emulate the uh, the emulate the cloud environment locally. So this is termed as a complete local development tool because it emulates the cloud environment on the local machines for us. So it needs Node.js to run, and it is installed using npm install as well. And all the documentation is available here in the GitHub repository. Uh, it's given in pretty detail, so you should be able to get started. What it does is it creates a reverse proxy uh, locally for us. And it, uh, we have three servers. The first one is the static content server. Then there's the authentication emulator and the functions core tools runtime. And the reverse proxy is at the heart of this entire CLI. And it routes specific requests to specific parts of the uh, package. So slash dot auth is forwarded to auth emulator, slash API goes to the API function, and everything else goes into the static web app. So if you need to um, test routing rules, or if you need to test your authentication rules for specific routes, then you have to have this tool locally. You can, by all means, run your Azure functions and your uh, app concurrently, and you can test your work. But if you want to actually emulate the cloud environment and test the routing rules, then this is the tool that you need to go for. And finally, one more um, tool is the Visual Studio Code extension that we have called Azure Static Web Apps Visual Studio Code Extension. Again, this is something in preview as well. What this helps me do is create and manage a static web app from Visual Studio Code. So in my first demo that I have for you today, we we'll use this starter template that I just checked out. It is based on a REST API, a very simple REST API function. We will use this particular Visual Studio Code Extension to create an Azure Static Web App and deploy that all the way to the portal. So I should have the clone repository here. So it has got three uh, folders, the API folder, which contains the we a weather forecast function. It gives me random results. Then there's the client folder, which is the Blazor WebAssembly based project. And then there's a shared project for uh, the models. And then, um, Another thing that you need to note down is here is that the API project is .NET Core 3.1 based. At this point of time, managed API functions, which are like the uh, API function that is part of the package, uh, can only support .NET Core, uh, Node.js 12, and Python as well. You have to bring in your own function in a production app if you want to have .NET 5 based Azure functions. Again, the Blazor project in the starter template is pretty old, but I know that there's a pull request in place to kind of modernize it and bring it up to .NET 5. Um, so let's have a look at the uh, local CLI tool first and see what happens here. So with the local CLI tool, I can run the Azure functions and the app all at the same time and emulate the uh, environment completely. So let's have a look at the app itself. Uh, the command for it is swas start. Uh, I need to use my local development server for that and get it running for that, first of all. So I use local host 5000 because Blazor runs on this port uh, or .NET Core runs on this port. Uh, and I need to run this .NET watch run. I also need to run my API. So I'm so sorry, uh, API. Let me just clear this up. There's one mistake I made here. Before I run this, I need to get into my client folder and then start from there. So, so I'll start um, HTTP 
localhost 5000 hyphen hyphen run dot net watch run hyphen hyphen api and then the folder path to my api folder which is one level up so this should start everything for me hopefully okay now if i go visit my browser uh localhost 4280 is the port where it all runs it is thinking something and yay i have my app so it's based on the blazer starter app that you already get as a part of visual studio template um, as you can see this is not loading because of certain course issues so let's stop this and uh, let's see what's happening so i'm happy that mistake happened so in the local settings example.json there is this course credentials and the course rules that's been put in and it says in the repository itself that it needs to be done uh, i need to change the local settings example json to local settings json it's one thing i always forget so let me rename this and then start again. If I'm already browsed to 4280 in a browser, it might actually lock everything up. So I have closed all my browser tabs. It should run now uh, and give me some result. Let's just go and do it now. Oh yeah, keeps jumping. I don't know why. Let's first start HTTP colon slash local host 5000 minus minus run dot net watch run. We'll try for one more time before I move on. Okay, that should be it. To 80. There we go. That is the data loading from my weather forecast Azure function. Now let us try and deploy this all the way into uh, an Azure uh, resource uh, using the extension that we have. So I have installed the extension and it's all, and I'm logged into my Azure uh, portal as well. So I can use the extension and this icon here to create a static web app. So it's asking me to commit something which I am commit, committing, yeah. Um, so now it has started giving me alerts. So I need to first create, enter a new name for the Azure static web app. I'm gonna go with the defaults. It's now going to ask me about the, uh, the build preset. Uh, I'm choosing Blazor, and that is how it understands the build process that it needs to uh, undertake. The next uh, thing it asks me is the location of the application code, uh, and this is where the app resides. And for me, the app resides in the client folder. Uh, the next thing is the build output folder. So this is where all your static assets, including imagery, the HTML, and the JavaScript resides. For Blazor, it's the www root folder. So I'm going to leave that in here. And that creates the resource group, creates a resource, uh, deploys that resource, and also deploys the code for me. What it also does is a git pull, if you might have noticed that. And the git pull is because uh, in the git repo that I've just created, it goes in and adds a GitHub action. Uh, and this GitHub action is responsible for deploying my code to the Azure portal uh, resource that it has created. Let's go and have a look at the action itself while the work is in progress. 
there are two jobs in this uh, GitHub Actions. And it li listens to the branch main because that is where it is all tied up to. And uh, every time a pull request is opened, synchronized, reopened, or closed, it listens to that branch uh, as well. There are two jobs, build and deploy job and a close pull request job. What happens is with the build and deploy job, the, uh, the work is deployed to production. The most important things to note here is the app location, which is the client here, which I've said that it's my client because it's that's the folder which holds my app code. The app location is the location of the app folder. The API location is the folder in which the API code resides. And the output location is actually what serves the static content out. In my case, it's www root. With the close pull request job, um, again, it keeps a watch on it. It uh, deploys a staging environment. Sorry, not with the close job. Whenever a close pull request is um, executed, it deletes the staging environment for me, as well as deploys, deploys to the production for me. That's what happens with the GitHub Actions. So let's go and have a look at the GitHub Actions itself and see what's going on. It's still deploying the resource. Uh, it's deployed the resource. It's deploying the code for me now. Let's hope that it succeeds. Let's go and see whether anything is deployed. It's still waiting for content. Meanwhile, let's go and have a look at the resource group it is created and uh, the static web app and see what is in the various different blades. So this is the static web app uh, in the Azure portal. Uh, and as you can see, it has got a source branch it is tied up to. In the configuration blade, you can uh, have any app settings that you want. If you have a function that talks to a database, you can have that app setting here. Uh, you can enable application insights. Um, custom domains can be managed from here. And this is where you have the Azure functions. Um, it's very subtle. You cannot do much with it because you cannot manage it. It is managed by the service for you. Here you can see the list of environments. I only have a production environment. If I have a pull request open, I will have a staging, staging environment as well. The role management screen is quite an important one um, because this is from where you can send invites to user for inviting them to app. The whole plan gives away the information about uh, the app itself. So let's try and refresh and see whether anything is happening. It's still in progress. Let's keep a watch on that and move on uh, to the next slide. Let's talk about API support in Azure Static Web Apps. Uh, with Azure Static Web Apps, APIs are completely optional. So theoretically, you could have a Blazor app or any app which talks to a completely third-party API, uh, which is of interest for me again, because I do a lot of, of work with Umbraco Headless and um, connecting Blazor apps to Umbraco headless CMSs. So that is something uh, that is like a perfect candidate for Azure Static Web Apps. With APIs, there are two configurations. There's the managed and the bring your own. The managed is where it, it is a complete part of the package. Uh, and it is available for both the free as well as the premium production plans, uh, premium hosting plans. With bring your own, that is available only on the production or the standard hosting plan. But if you bring your own, you can have um, your own uh, deployment plan and everything for that Azure function. And managing that Azure function is the, your responsibility from there on. Uh, there is something that you need to take care of while you have your API, regardless of whether it's managed or bring your own. The API root is prefixed to slash API. So slash API slash something is where your APIs would listen to. And in the production environment, it is served from the same origin as the app using a reverse proxy. So uh, course is never an issue when it gets to the environment. And the authentication and authorization for the environment is very strongly tied up to the environment itself. And as much as the app has got access to the user information, APIs have access to the user information as well. There are certain catches as well with API support. Uh, managed functions only support Node.js 12, uh, .NET Core 3.1, or Python 3.8 runtimes. And 
it's only with bring your own that you can have, say, a .NET 5 based Azure function. Logs are available only if you enable application insights, and there's not much room uh, which you get with your routing rules with APIs. You can only use, it, use routing rules to secure your APIs down. And managed functions only support HTTP trigger. So there are certain catches as well. Now let's go back and see whether the, uh, yeah, whether the action is deployed. So it's deployed now. So let's go and refresh the app. So that is the app here. Uh, if you look at weather forecast, let me just refresh it. As you can see, it's getting served from the same uh, domain and the endpoint is slash API slash weather forecast. Uh, now let us make a very small change um, to my app and try and commit it to another branch and see what happens. So let us create a branch, mm, test branch, very good name for the branch. And then in my pages say, hello, Azure Thursdays. Let's commit it and push it. Again, fantastic messages, I would say. Uh, I'm going to push this yeah, uh, branch up to a new upstream branch. So that's gone in. Let's go have a look. So it's asking me to create a pull request. I'm going to create a pull request. Now I'm going to just leave the defaults in there. So it's ready to be merged. And let's see what happens in the action. As you can see, the app is looking or watching over the main branch. And every time a, a pull request is created to the main branch, it triggers another deployment. But what this will be doing is creating a staging environment for me and posting the link of that staging environment back into my pull request. Let's wait till that uh, runs. But meanwhile, we'll carry on and see, uh, go forward with the slides a bit more. Let's talk about application configuration now. Uh, application configuration like routing and uh, fallback routes, a lot of that is managed using a very powerful file called staticwebapp.config uh, JSON file. So I think previously when uh, static web apps as a service was in public preview. The file was called routes.json, but now it is called staticwebapp.config.json. And uh, static web apps, uh, SWAs expect this file to be uh, in the app folder, that is the client folder, at the root or in its subfolders. The file is a very powerful one. It controls a lot of things. It can control routing, fallback rules, and much more. And there's also an overlap between the config file routes and authentication and authorization as well. So some of the things that you can do is redirects. So you can redirect one path to another using the uh, routes. You can have rewrites. You can have headers attached to routes. So you can have global headers uh, for the end, um, which is passed with every response, or you can uh, play with a single response using a routing, routing rule. If you are using the same uh, header, both in global as well as a specific route, then make sure that the global headers come first and the specific ones come later on, because the, the position of the routing rules also kind of um, makes an importance in this case. So I try to play with the cache control here. Uh, I wanted to have a cache control uh, caching time of like two hours on, a, on the entire site, but on a certain route alone, I wanted like one hour. So I had to put my global headers high up in the hierarchy of the page and then have my more specific route later on so that that would take effect. So just have, th have that in mind while you do that. You can also have navigation fallbacks. These are particularly important when you have single page applications like Blazor, which makes use of client side routing. So if you deploy a Blazor app without the navigation fallback, what happens is if you browse to a route directly that's being served by the Blazor router, uh, or if you refresh a page, 
what the static web app will try to do is it will try to serve you a static content of the um, of the same file name. So it might uh, try to find a counter.html or a fetch data.html, and it might not work. The way Blazor works is every request to a Blazor app goes into the index.html in www root folder. So we need to have a rewrite in place so that every request to the Blazor app hits the index.html. The index.html is here. And it's a very powerful file because that is where you have the app component in Blazor. And this app component in Razor is what has the router in it and manages all the routing for you. So we need to make sure that there's a rewrite in place for this. And you can also exclude certain parts from the rewrite, like images or CSS can be excluded as well. More things that you can achieve with um, the, the routing rules is response overrides. You can create, in my example, it's serving up custom error pages. Um, and you can also whitelist IPs if needed. So let's go back to uh, the deployment and see how it is in progress. So it has actually deployed something. Let's go back to the pull request and see what's happening. It's posted a link for me in here as a comment. So this is my staging environment. So that is a different link, as you can see, and it says Azure Thursdays. Now, if I go back into my portal and look at my environments, that test branch is in place for me. Now, if I go back and close that pull request, it merges this to, into the main, deploys that into the production, and deletes the staging environment uh, as well. So it kind of maintains itself as well. So let's move on now um, to security around uh, Azure Static Web Apps. Security, that is authentication and authorization is kind of really tightly um, tied up to the platform. We have uh, access to a series of pre-configured providers like Azure AD, GitHub, and Twitter. And the way users or users get access to an authenticated app is via invitations only. So in the role management screen, I can invite someone if needed. Uh, and the authentication providers I have is GitHub and Twitter with a Facebook and Google preview as well. Um, and once logged in, users be belong to both authenticated and anonymous, uh, authenticated role. And uh, by default, everyone is anonymous. You can create your own role names if you need. And that can be specified here. Um, if you want custom roles uh, to be created and uh, you want to skip the invitation process, the only provider that can take care of that for you is the Azure AD provider with a custom tenant. None of the other uh, providers or even being in a uh, in a production plan cannot skip over the invitations because users join only by invitation. The only way you can have a custom registration process is through a Azure AD provider. And uh, the way the authentication is controlled on a route basis is through the static web app config JSON. I'll quickly show you how the route rules look like for this. So in the static uh, web app config, uh, I can define routes. So this is a rewrite. Let's just get rid of this. I don't have this route at the moment, so I'm going to just say allowed roles. And then I can say authenticated is allowed, admin is allowed, et cetera. And uh, of course, you need to have users in the admin role as well for allowing access to this particular route. There's a system folder called slash dot auth, which is used for all authorization related APIs. I would I would have loved to show you a demo of this, but we can see if we can see uh, whether there's time for a demo later on uh, in my session. But just moving on um, to get the user information from the log, uh, the authentication provider, 
uh, you can get that using the client principal data object. So the client uh, principal data object can be you, uh, obtained using a get request to the API endpoint slash dot auth slash me. Again, it's a very fixed endpoint, regardless of the provider you use. And slash dot auth slash me is the endpoint that you get the information about the current logged in user from. So if there is no current logged in user, the object would be null. And this is for the app. And if you want to get the user information in your API, there's a request header for that called XMS client principle, which gives you access to the uh, a base 64 encoded string containing the JSON object. So that is about uh, authentication and authorization. Now let's take a slight detour from here because the second demo for my day is uh, around GraphQL and how we can have a static web app with a GraphQL function deployed into the portal. So what is GraphQL? It's a query language for APIs, and it's supported by a runtime for fulfilling those queries. And the most important thing is that GraphQL does not have any uh, particular, or it's not particular about where your data resides. All of this uh, query language and the runtime for fulfilling those queries, it's all based on your existing data. GraphQL is one of the very cool kids on the block when it comes to talking about APIs. And all GraphQL is is a query language and a runtime which understands that query language, parses it, and serves you the result. In a nutshell, what GraphQL is is specifying types and asking for specific fields on those specific types. Some features about GraphQL, uh, they, it is strongly typed. At the heart of every GraphQL endpoint is something called a schema, and schema is made up of types. Um, GraphQL is a specification, so it's like a contract or a blueprint. There are many, many different implementations of GraphQL across various different programming languages and frameworks, and each of those implementation tries to fulfill this particular specification. GraphQL is introspective. Now, that is a very interesting feature of GraphQL because a GraphQL endpoint can query itself to understand more about itself. And this feature has given rise to uh, browser-based IDs and standalone IDs, which are used for testing and a lot more uh, syntax highlighting, etc. We will have a look at it later on. I've got a sample for you on that. GraphQL is hierarchical. So if you consider your uh, say database or a collection of data entities, uh, they are all related uh, and that can be visualized as a data graph. What GraphQL helps you is extract parts of that data graph, which is the reason it's called GraphQL. And objects have relationships and GraphQL respects that relationships and therefore is hierarchical. And what you get back from a GraphQL query is um, a JSON response that mirrors the query. Again, I'll show you that in a um, moment. GraphQL is an application layer, so it's, it com comes somewhere in between your app as well as the existing data. So all GraphQL is interested in is getting your query, understanding it, reaching out to where your data is, and massaging it and giving it a shape that you asked for. Uh, it doesn't concern itself about where the data resides. The data can come in from a database, a database of any type, SQL Server, Oracle, um, MongoDB, Cosmos, uh, a, a, any of that. It can even be another REST API service or even another GraphQL uh, endpoint itself uh, through uh, something called schema stitching. GraphQL is version free, so we don't have any hassle of versioning with GraphQL. This is because client and client or the consuming app and the a API are very loosely coupled when it comes to using GraphQL endpoints. With, uh, Graph uh, with clients that consume GraphQL end endpoints, the client is in charge of what they want, to ask what they want, and they get exactly what they want. So we have a loose coupling between the client and the API, which means that the client and the API can re, uh, iterate and develop at their own pace. The only time you can break the, that correlation between the client and the API is if you delete a field of the endpoint or if you change the nullability of a, of a field in the endpoint. So GraphQL is version-free, and if you're thinking versioning with GraphQL, you're probably approaching it in the wrong way.
And GraphQL is finally transport layer agnostic. GraphQL over HTTP is the most popular way of doing GraphQL and consuming GraphQL, but GraphQL can be consumed and um, consumed across TCP, gRPC, and so on. Um, GraphQL schema is what is at the heart of GraphQL endpoint, and it's made of types. So we have object types in GraphQL schema, which is representation of real world entities, like say a book and an author, which you can query or get information about. Then you have queries, which are the operation types in GraphQL for getting or reading data. Then you have mutations, which is the operation type for inserting, updating, or deleting data and subscriptions, which are uh, operation types of pushed updates. And all of this makes up the types in GraphQL schema. So the most important thing to understand here is that object types, queries, mutations, and subscriptions all are types in a GraphQL schema. And types are made up of fields with each field having a name using which we can query the field. You have a scalar or complex type to which the data resolves to. And then you have resolvers, which resolves the field into the particular data type. And with any implementation of GraphQL, you are creating the schema and specifying the fields. Uh, today, I'm going to use Hot Chocolate, which is an implementation of uh, GraphQL in .NET. It's an open source GraphQL server for .NET. And I'm going to be building my um, GraphQL endpoint using Hot Chocolate, which is a package. And I have installed the three packages into my API function. What I have here is a Visual Studio uh, solution with an API and a client folder. Now, I haven't made use of the starter template for this particular demo. I just wanted to see uh, what it takes. Uh, I have a .NET 3.1 based API here. And my Blazor app is .NET 5 based. And there are two, three things I had to add. The first one being the local settings.json to get uh, to have the course rules in place. Uh, then I have my static web app config in my client for the navigation fallback. And in my app settings development, I have the base address for my Azure uh, endpoint, uh, Azure function endpoint local, which is localhost 7071. So let's start with the Azure uh, Azure function itself. So I've got Hot Chocolate ASP.NET Core installed uh, and the Microsoft Azure Functions extensions installed because I need to inject some middleware into the pipeline. And I've also got this package uh, called Azure Functions Proxy. Now, this package gives the middleware for Azure Functions. And what that middleware does is when the request comes in, it parses uh, the request and then forwards that the GraphQL executor pipeline. So it's basically the middleware, the pipelines that you have in place. And once I have installed it um, in the startup, I have registered the Azure Functions GraphQL into my services. Um, I also have a book repository here, which gets me uh, a, a list of books or gets me a book by its ID. And I've registered that into my startup. This one we will talk about in a bit. So what I have today as an API is an endpoint which gets me a list of books. And the models behind the scene is a book, which is a plain Poco class with ID, title, and an author. And I've also got the author, which is an ID and the name. Now, these are plain POFO classes. I need to let the schema know that such models are available, and I am going to create object types for that. And for that, I have this book type and author type corresponding to my POFO classes. So the way you start off uh, creating an object type is inherit from the object type um, class and give it my base source or base class, which is book. And then I can override and configure it. This method helps me override the names or the field type or the description that I have. So there are a couple of ways of doing this in hot chocolate. I usually go for this particular way of doing it because then I can make it clear to the attendees that this is an object type and um, types are what which makes the schema. So for each of the field in my POCO class, I have added some overriding. 
I've got the field name overridden uh, and everything, everything is in lowercase now. I've also added descriptions. And th these are very useful because it gets picked up as documentation in the browser-based IDEs. And I've also got the returning type for each of these uh, fields. The last one is of particular importance. It, it, it returns an author type. And that is because my book class, um, the book author is an author type. And I've got a corresponding object type for the author as well, which with each of the fields overwritten with their own types. So that is the object types. Now for the query, uh, which is the root operation type. Uh, I've got a class here called query, and I've injected the book repository into it. And I've got methods for getting uh, a list of books or getting a single book by its ID. Now, I need to register this query as a type in my GraphQL schema. And again, for this, I've got a query type, which inherits from object type passing in the query. Again, I can override the field names in here. Uh, and in the second case where I'm getting a book, I also need an argument in place so that I can pass in the ID uh, that comes in from my query. Uh, so that is the query type. Now I can register that query type in my startup function. Uh, I need to first add the GraphQL server so that the GraphQL server itself is getting uh, up and running and I can add my query type using an add query type ex uh, add query type extension method and register and give it the type as well. What this in turn will do is it will go and register all the corresponding types that it is talking to. That is the book type and the author type. The most important thing to understand here is that the query type is also a type in GraphQL and each of these are fields. So get books, get book, they are all operations, but they are fields in the query type. With GraphQL, it's important to test your queries. And for that, we have IDEs. Uh, they can be browser-based or standalone ones. The IDEs help with syntax highlighting, IntelliSense, error highlighting, and a lot more. Uh, and one of the finest features about GraphQL is schema introspection uh, because it it, these IDs make use of the introspective feature of a GraphQL endpoint to have up-to-date documentation. There are many, many IDs available out there. Oh, sorry, I skipped a slide. Uh, graphical, I think, was the first one. Then you have GraphQL Playground, and all of these can be baked into your GraphQL endpoint itself. Uh, most of these are browser-based, except for Insomnia and Banana Cake Pop. Insomnia is standalone desktop app. Banana Cake Pop is, again, from the house of Chili Cream, uh, uh, and that is where hot chocolate is from. Banana Cake Pop is standalone and is not open source, but I, I believe that one of the upcoming release or probably the release that we have right now, in, uh, you can bake in Banana Cake Pop just like you would have a graphical or GraphQL playground as a part of your endpoint. So I've got... Um, Let's start my Azure function and the app. And this is Banana Cake Pop. We have the ability to refresh the schema, reload the schema, uh, et cetera. And what it does is it reads the schema and generates that in a much more readable fashion for me here. So if I go into get books, I can see that it is returning me a list of book types. So the square brackets mean it's a list in um, GraphQL. And I can click through each of the field and understand what each of the field is all about. So if you have a big GraphQL endpoint, this can be extremely useful. And not only to the fields in the object types, you can have descriptions to each of the uh, methods as well. Uh, so I can actually add a description to each of the operation in the query type and get that out here for the end user who is using it. So I've got some queries in place. Uh, the way you start off a uh, GraphQL query is using a query keyword. You give a, a, a arbitrary name for your operation, and then you can start using the actual field in your query type, which is get books in my case. And I can ask for specific fields. Now, if I execute this, it gets me a list of books. 
So it is only getting me ID and title because I asked only for ID and title. I cannot say get me everything about Gatebooks. That just won't work. And it's already highlighting an error for me. Now, if I want to get user uh, author information here, I have to start off with the author. And because it's an object type in itself, I have to then specify the fields I want. I can say author name and execute, and it gets me the author name as well here. But as you can see, what the response that I get here is an ex exact mirror image of my query here. Now, if you want to have uh, an argument passed in, uh, I again start off with the query and an arbitrary name. This time I'm using get book and passing in say an ID of two and asking for the details. Again, I should be able to get the results here. There should be a variable dictionary here using which I can pass in GraphQL variables. So if you want to make this particular get book more generic, I can uh, specify an argument here, say dollar ID. This is how you specify a variable in GraphQL, and it's of int type non-nullable. And then I can assign the variable value to my argument, and I can pass in the variable as a separate dictionary here, and then execute this. Should get me the same result. So that is our <clears throat> API up and running. We also need a client uh, tool to consume this API. We can, by all means, use HTTP client. I'm using Strawberry Shake, again, from the house of Chili Cream. What Strawberry Shake helps me do is generate strongly typed C Sharp client from GraphQL queries. So I can take the GraphQL queries that I showed you and put that into a queries document. It helps me generate a strongly typed C-sharp client for me. So which means that the result that I get back as a, a result of the operations, uh, which is the data that you see in here, it's completely deserialized for me. And I only need to concentrate on the uh, communication part rather than writing 1,000 different POCOs, uh, trying to deserialize that properly for me. The setup nodes are available here, but I'm not going to go into great detail about it, but what we start off with is a GraphQL client. You can add from here. You specify your endpoint, the client name, um, and the namespace. It downloads the schema. And then what I can do is start writing my queries in a GraphQL, uh, GraphQL, dot GraphQL extension, extension file. And for each of the queries that I have, each of the operations that I have, it generates uh, operation service in the client for me. So this is the generated folder which contains my client. So there should be an operation service called get books in my client. And the, each of those operation services has got an execute async method which reaches out to the API and gets back the data for me. So uh, I think my app is up and running. So in this component, I've got the data coming in from the API. So let's have a look at what is happening. The client, once generated, can be registered into the um, DI container. It's a named client that I get. And I am passing in the base address. Uh, the base address is the, the one I specified in the app settings development JSON for my local environment or in the production environment or when it gets to the SWA is the base address of the host environment. I also need to uh, uh, append the API slash GraphQL at the end because that's how it reaches out to the endpoint. Uh, and I don't know whether there's a better way of doing it, but this is the only way I could get this working. There's one thing I missed out in the whole lot here, um, the actual GraphQL function, which is here into which I've injected this executor proxy. And from there, the uh, executor execute functions query async method is called passing in all the details, which does the work of parsing the request and executing the GraphQL query and getting back the result. The route is set to GraphQL, which is the reason I have API slash GraphQL here. And API is the, uh, the root prefix needed for the API. So I have got the API as well here. Now let us try and deploy this into the portal. So now I'm going to start off with the resource here. 
uh, I'm going to create a resource called static web app. Create. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to put it in my existing resources, Azure Thursdays. GraphQL demo. That's the name of my static web app. I'm going to select free as the option. I'm going to host it in West Europe. My code is in GitHub. So it lets me log in. I can find the password shortly. I'm going to select my repository here. That's my repository. The branch is master. The build preset is again Blazor. The app location is slightly different in my case because I've got a very different name for my folder here, which is Azure Thursdays.graphql.swa, which I'm going to put here. The API location remains the same. The output location remains the same. I'm going to review and create the web app. I'm going to create this. What this also does is goes and creates um, a GitHub action for me in my GitHub repo. Did I do that? There we go. Actions. An action is already running, and it has created the workflow for me, which has got both the build and deploy, as well as the close pull request job. And the action is running for me, so it should get deployed in a short while. Let's just wait and have a look while that is getting done. I think that is all what I had for the day. So while that is running, I can pick up some questions if you have any for me. We do. We were, <laughs> we were, we were a bit mesmerized about everything you just showed us. So I totally forgot to write down any questions from the <laughs> I hope it was at a phase that you could understand <laughs> no, there's a lot going on. It was just. From when you started with GraphQL, I was too focused to even write something down. But I did write, <laughs> I did write down a, a question that might be quite clever about the mm -hmm. static web apps. So is there any clear cutoff point where you would stop using a static web app and move over to app service or something a little bit bigger in scope? Um, it depends, really. Um, you are the best person to kind of judge that, I think. Uh, for me, personally, the project that I kind of think about um, is Blazor with Umbraco Headless. Uh, and I see a lot of things in that community where you have a Vue or Angular or React or Nuxt.js based apps, which talks to these external APIs as well. And for me, those are the kind of perfect candidates for SWAs. Um, Azure Web Apps, not at the moment, because if you are thinking about scaling, this is already scaled for me. I don't need to worry about that. Um, with the API support, I have the ability to bring in my Azure functions. Um, so at this point, as it stands, uh, no, I cannot think of a particular point where I would switch from uh, static web apps to app service. The only thing I could have said is about Blazor server, because being a SignalR service, it could have uh, benefited from app service. But again, Blazor server is not the candidate. It's not a candidate at all for SWA, because it's, it needs server-side rendering. Any, any app, any web app, which doesn't need server-side rendering is what SWA is suited for. And I believe this is a platform which is still being kind of developed and kind of, uh, and it's very niche as well. So uh, I, I believe you can ask for feature requests of your own as well, and Microsoft would 
probably listen to you because they want to see where the platform goes as far as I understand. Esther, do you have another question for Punima? Yes, I have. But um, first, maybe I need to explain that um, when I started in IT, I was building uh, web apps with ASP.NET. So this is like <laughs> a whole new world opening up to me. So I definitely need to uh, study on the new technologies that are available. So thank you for getting me excited and, and uh, um, eager to uh, adapt <laughs> a modern way of web apps. Um, but I did notice during the presentation that uh, a couple of times when you were referring to the relative paths mm -hmm. uh, for ALF and uh, API, mm -hmm. um, that it felt like you, um, and I'm trying to find the right words to phrase it, um that you felt a bit disappointed that those are uh that you cannot configure those relative paths yourself yeah. that those are set um and coming from an it background and security in mind um do you feel that that makes the static web apps more vulnerable for uh, attacks give, giving them uh, a, a bigger emphasis on uh, the need to definitely secure them better than uh, having relative paths that you can configure yourself. So the, the relative paths are only when it is on my local, I feel. When it gets to the server, the platform is all secure for you. There's a reverse proxy in place to talk back to your API. And that is one of the ways it serves it from the same domain. So whether it's your own Azure function or the managed function, it is protected for you because the reverse proxy protects it. Plus, you can add your own authentication to your API if needed using the routing rules. That is that in fact that is only one of the possible things which you can do with the api paths so i think if you take care of the api aspect api security aspect using authentication yourself um, there's of course the platform helping you with the security as well so i think we should be safe to do that yes the slash api is a bit uh, <laughs> for me as a it, developer it's a no flexibility. Yeah. <laughs> But we never know things could change in the future because, as I said, this is a platform which still Microsoft is kind of experimenting and trying to see what the community wants. And I believe and I hope they would listen to us right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm confident that they will listen, but that's from my own experience with yeah. different engineering teams and interacting with them. They are eager to get the feedback and, and uh, eager to... Uh, address and, and make it even more user friendly. So, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. For me, this is a very, very niche platform with a complete focus on just static content. So, I'm quite eager to wait and see how this grows as well. Uh, because there is Maui coming up, there will be progressive web apps, which takes the form of mobile apps as well. So, I am quite excited to wait and watch and see what comes out of it, how people experiment and come out with different ideas with static web apps as well. Well, I would love to invite you back in uh, a couple of months and see what the new feature set is and how we can even build uh, more cooler apps. I might yeah. even throw in a demo myself, but <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll need some time. I'm letting the cat out of the bag here because you and me know, like we all, all of us know, the talk I planned for the day was blaze more Blazor focused with Azure Web Apps. But when I started kind of looking at Azure Web Apps, it was like this needs to be a talk on Azure Web Apps, uh, static Web Apps, because there's so much, there's there's so much fun in doing what I just showed you today. Uh, it was there's uh, there's a lot of resources out there as well. So yeah. Uh, I had fun learning about Azure Static Web Apps as well. I don't use it personally, but I am also eager to learn new things. So all good. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks I, so much. Yeah, I I'm guess sorry. on that note. Wait and see uh, a minute whether the app is actually deployed because that's, yes, it oh, has yes. deployed. So if I go into my portal and refresh,
excitement. I love the names that the static web has given. It's completely random. <laughs> Yay, and that is data coming out of my GraphQL endpoint for uh, my static web app. So that is the live demo done for the GraphQL endpoint. And that's awesome. my resources link if you want to share it with the attendees as well. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for being here. So Esther. Yes. <laughs> We we did it, we made it to the end. Yes, so, <laughs> we went ten um, we went ten minutes over time, but it was totally worth it. Of course, and and we need to rebel every now and then. So I I, I guess um, people might already expect some of these actions happening from us. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I guess it's it's. Um, uh, smart to mention to those of you who are watch are still watching the stream and didn't <laughs> leave us already that we will have a short summer break. So next month there will not be an Azure Thursday, but we will get back to you in September, uh, bigger, better, bolder, um, with lots more fun uh, presenters. Yep, we'll make sure to update you soon on what we have planned for September. So for now, I think let's wave goodbye and go to bed. Yes. <laughs> Good plan. <laughs> so have a great <laughs> evening, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>